I'm Kate Fitzgerald from the Learning Hack team, welcoming you to the latest episode of Great Minds on Learning. This season is brought to you by Learning Pool, the company that helps you deliver exceptional performance with pioneering online learning platforms, creative content and powerful analytics. In this series, Donald Clark, the internationally famous author, blogger and entrepreneur, joins John Helmer to explore two and a half thousand years of thought and theorising about learning from the Greeks to the geeks. This episode is about a group of mostly 20th century thinkers who explored the moral dimension of learning within different cultural contexts and the increasing role of communications technology in those debates. So, the moralists. In some other episodes of this series so far, we focused on people who, very broadly speaking, wanted to discover how memory worked or to explore the ideal conditions for learning or the processes by which people learn. But looking at these names, it seems to me we're in different territory, as as much to do with philosophy and sociology as with science, perhaps. How do you characterise this group, Donald? I mean, what is morality and moralism doing in this podcast about learning? Well, it's a really, it's always fascinated, fascinated me, this topic, John, the, the role in which moral thinking plays in education and training and learning in general. And of course, it's always there. It's always been there. Uh, in a sense, learning theory has always been shaped by moral theory. So if you go back to the original religious leaders, you have Confucius, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, and then there are acolytes, of course, you've got people like St. Augustine, uh, Luther, Calvin. These are the people for 1,500 years at least, if not longer, arguably until the Enlightenment, really shaped what we learned, how we learned, and where we learned. So that moral push from those religious uh, 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 roots was always there. And then even in the Enlightenment, you have people like Locke, uh, uh, Rousseau, Wollstonecraft, and so on, and uh, strong moralists. Moral theory really was the very roots of their thinking on education. And then even the utilitarians like Bentham and Mill, uh, full of that, you know, uh, Victorian moral outrage, as it were, uh, and real political zealots with regard to reform. But even into things like, uh, you know, we have uh, the evolutionists, the impact of evolution and science on learning. And even with the science, the behaviourist cognitives, in a sense, they dampen down this interest in morals in learning in a more secular, objective, scientific world. But it Boy, did it come back with a, a, a back with a vengeance in the continental theorists like Habermas, Foucault, Lyra, Derrida, and so on. That whole structuralist, post-structuralist, full of moralizing. You know, I mean, you have people like Freire, greatly concerned with the education of the poor in South America and other places. Foucault, schools as prisons. Uh, you have uh, we have a lot of debate, moral debate, of course, around the crit- critics of schooling itself. People like Illich. Strong moral arguments for de-schooling. You have people like John Holt who have arguments for homeschooling based on moral principles. You have people like Thiel and Haidt and Kaplan, Sandel, Guthart, all criticizing higher education for producing the separate graduate class. So the moral dimension is just always there. However, That's a, uh, yeah, sorry, John, were you going to say something? You're mentioning a lot of education people. Does it play as well in the workplace learning context? Oh, yes, I think it's very similar. In fact, more recently, it's got quite intense, of course. Uh, HR departments are really, and the L&D departments are really delivering almost nothing but compliance training. Endless courses on ethics, on uh, unconscious bias, diversity, inclusion, the moral dimension. I mean, it's almost as if HR and L&D have become the moral guardians of employees, you know, which is rather odd. Almost taking the role of the clerisy or, or the church at some point, you know, they will tell you what the values are in your company. And if you don't adhere to those values, you're in trouble. They will tell you exactly how to behave. They are now trying to tell you how you think morally. They're mm-hmm. even trying to probe your unconscious with unconscious bias. This has become very intense very, very quickly. But coming back to the people we're tackling today, I think that, you know, the reason I've clustered this group together is they are very precise rather than generally using morality as a a wellspring for their theory. They tackle moral issues head on. So Abraham Maslow, whom we'll start on, although I don't like Abraham Maslow's theory at all, we'll come to that. But at Mm -hmm. least he's tackling that notion of basic human needs in learning. Mm-hmm. We have Lawrence Kohlberg, who, who mirroring Piaget really comes up with these stages of moral judgment how, and moral character. 
Uh, we have Mamie and Richard Clark, who looked at racism, one of the first set of research right in the middle of the civil rights movement, had a huge influence on a really important uh, case in education. So they were looking at racism. And then we come on and uh, we've got people like Jane Rowan Martin, who looked at the role of women in education. Why were they excluded for so long? Really until the early part of the 20th century. And then we'll end, of course, on the, the two big cultural theorists, I think, uh, and that's Marshall McLuhan and Neil Postman. Okay. who address that, that that big issue of technology and moral, you know, in what way, technology is a rather dangerous thing, you know, uh, what moral dimensions do they have in learning? So they're very a very precise group. So lots to get through. If we look at the timeline, they seem to cluster in the 20th century, mostly. Yeah. And were yeah. they influenced at all by each other? Or is it just that they kind of, are they in this group by virtue of the similarity in the type of areas they talked about? Yeah, I mean, they, they would have, this group are all in the 20th century. You know, you've got Maslow died around 1970, I think. So, you know, and then Kohlberg in the late 80s or whatever. Uh, they're all post-war theorists in a sense, Kohlberg and the Clark, certainly, you know. But even like Martin is the only one who's still alive, Jane Martin. Uh, she must be over 90 now, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. McLuhan died about 1980 uh, and Postman, Postman quite recently. had Postman's the most recent. He is 20 years in McLuhan. McLuhan but they're all really right in the middle of the 20th century. That's the timeline okay. of these people. So they would all been aware and all cross-read each other, I'm absolutely sure. So let's start with Maslow. Abraham Maslow, 1908 to 1970, very much a 20th century figure. In yes. fact, he was the 10th most cited psychologist of the 20th century. Born in Brooklyn, <laughs> yeah. grew up poor, persecuted by anti-Semitic thugs, hated his mother. Education was his route out of that upbringing. Um, but even that was a bit of a rocky road for him earlier on. He had a very behaviourist training, uh, interestingly enough, but yeah. was mentored by Alfred Adler, who's one of the big beasts of psychiatry. I, I'm sure he'll come in uh, further on as we start talking about clinical um, psychiatry. He came to be psychology professor at Brandeis, famous for his hierarchy of need. Maslow's hierarchy of need, incredibly big in trading. Donald, tell us about the hierarchy of need, and I think it's pyramid time again. Yeah, it is pyramid time again, and unfortunately. So this, I mean, the problem is that the hierarchy of need was never a Maslow thing. He never drew, published, or did anything remotely associated with a pyramid. A pyramid. And what he did was write a couple of very, in fact, his writings are really quite interesting and quite subtle. His theory of human motivation, the paper he wrote in 1943, is actually quite interesting, if not a bit crude, and there's no research in it at all. And then his book, 1954, on motivation and personality, he strips learning and training back to this sort of hierarchy of basic human needs and desires. But it isn't really a pyramid. So, and he also moved from one pyramid to another pyramid. But the story of the pyramid is actually quite bizarre because. How did we end up with this pyramid that appeared? I mean, we only know Maslow as a pyramid, in a sense, or a triangle. It actually goes back to a guy called Douglas McGregor at MIT Sloan School of Management, who took Maslow's general ideas, okay, and then applied them to management. Because Maslow never really wrote much about management or organizational training. That was Douglas McGregor. But then a guy called Keith Davis had a book on management, and he was the first to draw the triangle. It was actually a right-angled triangle, curiously, oh. with a pinnacle at the top. And then a psychologist called uh, Charlie McDermott uh, Dermid, in an article about called How Money Motivates Men. And it was all about making money, get a rich quick scheme. He was the first to produce the pyramid as a way of pushing profits. So this has got this really bizarre roots, this fictional triangle. And of course, with Maslow, you have two triangles. There has, the first one had five levels, which is the one you mm. most often see, uh, which goes up to self-actualization. But of course, later on, he changed and he added know and understand an aesthetic to that one and added on top of self-actualization, he actually added transcendence, which is, of course, all nonsense. But uh, why is it there? I think it's because a colored Pyramid looks good in PowerPoint. It's got fossilized into train the trainer courses and all sorts of other areas of human endeavor, of course. The mm. problem is there's absolutely no, it was never tested experimentally. It's an armchair theory. And boy, is it a bad armchair theory. I mean, first of all, there are hardly any women in there. In fact, there was only two, Eleanor Roosevelt and Mother Teresa, as if they were typical of women. <laughs> in These ways. are his examples of people who are self-actualized, is it? Yes. What, it, what he does is he, 
he has a list of only 18 people, 18 self-actualized people. If we get, we'll start with the, uh, the tip of the pyramid and then work back to the lower levels. I mean, these are essentially sort of biographical sets of data. S sits in his armchair, he comes up with 18 people, no control study at all associated with this. People like Einstein, Mother Teresa, Gandhi, Beethoven, Lincoln, you know, people who he regards as having self-actualized. And of course, researchers since have shown that this is absolute nonsense. Kendrick in 2010, there's huge variance across these self-actualized people. There's nothing in common amongst them at all. In fact, they show divergence rather than convergence. And of and course, it, yeah. Sorry, what what's what's he actually mean by self actualization? What does it mean to be self actualized? Well, the self actualization process is a bit vague, but I mean, once you've read it in detail, you still come away saying, "I have absolutely no idea what it means here." <laughs> <laughs> the point Sometimes is, it's not just me. <laughs> well, the, the self resolution. He has some some criteria by which which he identified as being present in in self-actualized people, okay? And these were things like, they, they tended to prefer, to prefer solitude. They, they, did, they were not subject to groupthink, for example. They were very much self, uh, you know, in a sense, in a sense, autonomous thinkers, uh, independent of humanity as a whole, groundbreaking, innovative people, people like Gandhi, you know, who comes up with a whole moral schema around nonviolence and in, uh, uh, in in changing the world and so on. These were the people, but of course they were they were pretty a pretty odd set of people in that respect. If you were doing this properly, and of course many researchers mm -hmm. since have looked at this problem, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have uh, you wouldn't have done what he did. And indeed, that's exactly what subsequent researchers have done. I think the transcendence thing has a bit of the sort of 60s hippie dumb thing yeah, about it. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds a bit like kind of Sergeant Pepper's Transcendental Meditation, that kind of stuff. Exactly. It comes out about that time. And of course, he was intimately connected with Timothy Leary. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, his, uh, there, were, there were experimental links between them, in fact. But the bottom line is that I think on transcendence and self-actualization, it smacks of the drug culture where one could achieve that, for example, hence his link with Timothy Leary. It smacks with the Hare Krishna Buddhist transcendence idea. Mm -hmm. But it goes back to real religious roots, I think, on this hierarchy of our species, you know, at the bottom going up through a, a church and clerisy and up into the top through some sort of form of divine revelation and salvation. I think it has very deep religious roots, Maslow's, mm. Maslow's idea. I've used it actually in, a, in event planning to, you know, when, you, when you're kind of kicking off a, a planning an event, you get your team together in the room and you say, all right, what is the state of mind of people when they arrive at the event? You know, because we want to manage the experience. And yeah. you, you show them as there's hierarchy of needs. say, well, the first thing, obviously, they want to know where they hang their coats, you know, how to go to the toilet and stuff like that. And you could kind of progress through the first three, three or four levels, but we'd never get up as far as self uh, actualization. <laughs> well, so yeah. can you talk a bit about the lower levels? Yeah, the lower levels. So these, the lower levels of the original triangle, which he called the four, the four at the bottom, which are the physiological needs, your safety and security, your love and belonging, yeah. self-esteem. These are what he called D needs, uh, so deficit needs. And if they're not present, you really will feel their absence. You know, you sort of yearn from them if they're not there. And this is quite important for a learner. You know, if people are hungry or haven't had enough sleep and so on, then until they're satisfied, you're not going to reach what he called a state of homeostasis. In other words, you're, you've had that need satisfied. You can now move on to the next layer, as it were, in, in his hierarchy. Uh, so this idea of homeostasis is important, you know, reaching a level, balanced view, and then you move on to the next one. But of course, the truth of the matter is that research shows that this is complete nonsense. It's mm. completely reductive and hierarchical, simple and crude. Human nature is just not like this. So Tay and Dina, a really interesting study in 2011, they take well over 60,000 people, okay, from 123 countries, and they were questioned on Maslow's needs. And it showed that the hierarchy was quite simply wrong. Quite simply wrong. You know, there are people like Van Gogh who were poverty stricken and hungry who absolutely reached what hierarchy, uh, what Maslow would call uh, self actualization. Mm -hmm. uh, Rutledge, for example, also claims that the hierarchy doesn't take into consideration the social context in which people live. Social connections are needed for all of these assumed levels in the hierarchy. And when you take the social dimensions into consideration, the hierarchy just sort of falls to pieces. It just doesn't mm. make any sense any longer. And the problem, the problem with this hierarchical move from one to another 
is the basic research he did, which was far too crude, far too yeah. crude. And then to move on, though, but what can we get from this? Not much. I, to be honest, I would rather abandon Maslow completely and utterly because the people who really do look at these problems in detail, for example, there are modern indicators for well-being amongst children by people like UNICEF, and there they bear no resemblance to Maslow's hierarchy whatsoever. They don't fall into a simple hierarchy of needs. So, unfortunately, I think this is a very good example of over-moralizing, simplification, a caricature of human nature. And yet we take it all too literally only because it's easy to present. Mm. <laughs> it's so easy to get this nice hierarchical structure, the idea that we're making steady progress towards some sort of weird nirvana at the top. Now, this suits trainers and academics who like to think that that's what they're doing to human beings. But in actual fact, the real world is far messier than this, far subtler than this. And the danger is that we caricature everything by using these models. So I've gone a bit heavy on Maslow there, but I really do think he's been a hugely destructive figure in that mm. he stopped us from realising that these things are much more complex than, the, uh, than, he, than his notion of sainthood leading to salvation in some way. So Lawrence Kohlberg, 1927 yeah. to 1987, also from a Jewish immigrant family, but a much more moneyed background, living in an upscale suburb of Manhattan, uh, the, the suburb associated with Kennedy's, attending an elite prep school. He had a pretty eventful time following w World War II, smuggling Jewish refugees from Romania through the British blockade into Palestine. He was captured by the British and held at an internment camp on Cyprus. But um, he himself believed in non-violent activism, although he was involved in the um, struggle to establish a Jewish, Jewish homeland in Palestine. After that, he studied at the University of Chicago, where he read Piaget, a big influence on his thought, um, professorships at Yale and Harvard. His big thing was stages of moral development. Yeah. Can you tell us about that, Donald? Yes, I think, I mean, Kohlberg was one of these, uh, you know, Jewish academics post-Second World War, who felt very strongly that we should try and understand what happened there, the disaster of the Holocaust and so on. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is really serious stuff. You know, he really had a, an important agenda morally to, to tell, to, he hoped to try and unpack moral thinking around education and training, this idea of a just community, which he had, you know, schools, professional groups, social groups, prisons, and so on. So, before we go into his stages, I think, you know, he had he saw educational theory as being split into three groups, the three being romanticism, the, you know, the romanticism with the formative figure being Rousseau, of course, the big figure there, the ch mm. child is a natural learner that's still with us. And then the second phase for him is cultural transmission. And that's that idea that you're passing on knowledge from one generation to the next, you know, a sort of banking method, which is a pretty much what modern education is, you know, a fixed curriculum and so on. And then... Mm. The third stage is progressivism. That's that's from he thinks that came from William James and John Dewey, who we've talked about in another podcast, who yeah. see education as an important contribution to society as a whole. And he sees himself as as a progressive. Okay. But he tackles one important issue, and that is how do we see moral development in children in education and in adults? And he comes up with a ripoff of Piaget, really. And we can talk about Piaget. Piaget got this wrong. Piaget was one of the worst scientists on the planet. Educated, you know, he really just asked his own kid questions until they got the answer he liked. That was his, that's about some of Piaget's research. Uh, to be fair to Kohlberg, he was a bit more sophisticated than that. But we have these levels. There are, so there are three main levels and each have two. Six stages, but three groups of two. If I get these right. So you've got the pre-conventional pre -conventional level, which is... You know, you very young children who, if you've had a, if you've had a baby and a young child, you know they th they're very egoistic and driven by feeding and basic needs. Okay, mm -hmm. so you've got this idea that just basically punishment and obedience are the two big drivers there. You know, they're really egoistic. It's a very sort of relativist orientation they have towards the world, rewards for good behaviour. So the first two levels are pre-conventional young children. The next one is conventional, where you start. You know, you find that children start to obey society and family rules all of a sudden. They suddenly get it. You know, if I obey badly, it has consequences. But they don't have a huge amount of rational reflection on this. It seems to happen naturally that they adopt a moral outlook towards the world and other people. Okay, so you've got 
two things here, this interpersonal orientation around morals, and then the realisation that you're in a big group of people here, your family and society and your classrooms at school, and you've got to behave morally or you're in real trouble. So that's level two. Then the third level is what you call post-conventional. And the two big ones here is this social contract idea and, and the more universal ethical principles. You start to reflect and understand that there are general rules that apply to people in terms of ethical behavior in society. And you can't go around abusing people and uh, behaving as your instincts would tell you to behave. You develop your own eth awareness of ethical principles. And so Colbert thinks that you move through all these, skipping none of them. And that's the way in which morals develop in the brain. Uh, now, there are the, the higher levels, this happens to a sort of cognitive, he called it, uh, you know, this, this equilibrium, cognitive dissonance. You actually go through these stages by encountering this, these, you know, you, if you just behave egoistically, you quickly find out that the world will not adapt to your needs. So it's this encounters, challenges, uh, this e equilibrium that forces you to change as new experiences cause this cognitive mm -hmm. conflict. So it's drawing upon Piaget's stages of cognitive development, people like John Rawls, these hypothetical stages of moral, moral judgments. And he had these things called moral judgment interviews, MJIs, where moral problems are presented to people and then we look at the reasoning. How are they thinking about this? And that's how we learn how the brain deals with the moral issues. There is a big problem with this, however. But do you want to ask anything more about that? Well, I was just going to just reflect, really. I mean, it, it just feels a bit disembodied. I mean, if we're talking about children, the way that children develop a moral sense, it yes. kind of maps onto, but doesn't, to the kind of popular wisdom type of thing. You know, I, I've kind of got grown up children, as you have. And when I talk to younger parents, I say, you know, just prepare yourself for when they when they hit puberty, they go to the dark side. <laughs> and their peer group is more important to them than what you you say to them or anyone else says to them. And it's all right, don't worry, eventually they come back. And it just doesn't seem that there's any kind of, I mean, if he is talking about school children, all teachers will know this, that, you know, pu puberty is a massive kind of um, roadblock <laughs> in the middle of trying to, to civilise human beings. And it's just, it feels a bit divorced from our biology. That's absolutely right, John. So you hit the nail right on the head here. The problem with Kohlberg's schema, it's a bit like Maslow, is it's too simplistic, too staged, lacks subtlety and nuance. So, you know, most more people like Jonathan Hyden, modern theorists on how the brain thinks about morality are really intuitionists. They don't think mm. that we're rational beings and reflect in that way. And they reject this idea of rational moral reasoning lying at the root of or playing the primary role in moral behavior. And I think they're right, to be honest. Uh, but the, the problem is that actually what Kohlberg may be doing here is just interpreting what is instinctive or intuitive moral judgment that it comes mm. naturally. And that's fair enough, but there are big problems here. The first one was absolutely right. So take the puberty peer group issue. Now, Judith Harris comes along in the late 20th century and rips Kohlberg apart. It, she really says, listen, when you look at how kids behave when they're teenagers, they have no moral reaction to their parents. Their parents have absolutely no influence in them whatsoever. Actually, their personalities are shaped about 50% personality. The other 50%, about 45% to 40, actually, she thinks it's even higher. About 45% is peer group, which is why mm. immigrant children have the accents of their peer group and not their parents. But the same is true generally of behavior. They adopt the moral precepts, not of their parents, but of their peer groups. So in many ways, Kohlberg got it the wrong way around. It's not about reasoning and there aren't definite stages. And if there are stages, they're very different. But there mm. were other big critics of Kohlberg here. Uh, 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 I mean, I think, Elliot Turiel said, listen, all this is massively fueled also by social convention. If you go to different parts of the world, you'll find that diff different social conventions apply differently to this type of moral thinking. And mm -hmm. Carol Gilligan <laughs> rightly uh, uh, took him a task for simply, she thought he simply reinforced stereotypical male traits. Yeah. Uh, because almost all of the people he studied were, uh, were male. And mm -hmm. then more recently, we have people like Jonathan Haidt, who undercut this whole approach of rational uh, rational moralizing with social in intuitionalism. Uh, uh, in other words, it's almost our evolutionary heritage has given us altruism, uh, the ability to read other minds and sympathize with other people. It seems to come naturally to people. 
It's not a result of instruction or training, which mm. far too many people think it is. That's why I have a big beef about moralizing in education and training. So how influential was he? And was that influence felt beyond education? And does he still have influence? Well, I think Piaget had massive influence, uh, even though his four stages were proved to be wrong. Mm. Uh, and similarly with Kohlberg, it was very fashionable for a long, people of time, a long period of time, especially in the US. And the odd thing is it bubbles back again. So almost every conservative government or right-wing government comes in, tries to impose character or moral training into the educational curriculum. We get this regularly in the UK. In every 10 years or so, there's some several million pounds is spent on character training. It's actually a feature of a sort of, you know, old public school idea of the playing school, uh, you know, the playing fields of Eton or something. It's totally mis misleading. You cannot, it's not an abstract thing that you can teach. It comes as a, an epiphenomenon of other forms of teaching, like sport or, uh, or general behavior in classrooms and so on. So I think it had massive influence. The problem is it keeps getting resurrected. <laughs> so people go back to Kohlberg every time they want to look at character uh, character training. And again, the research is it's not something you can actually teach directly. The way we work has changed and the way we learn is changing too. But 70% of organisations don't feel that their learning systems can really cope with all this change. It seems there is a disconnect between what learners need right now and what most learning suites provide. In a new white paper, Ben Betts and I tell the story of how this disconnect happened and lay out a vision of what a modern learning system ought to be and do. It's called Sweet Dreams and you can read it now. Mamie and Kenneth Clark, next, 1917 to 1983. Those are Mamie's dates. I don't have Kenneth Clark's dates, yeah. I'm afraid. They're Maybe. a husband and wife team and a very remarkable couple indeed. Um, Mamie was the first black American to gain a PhD in exper experimental psychology. Uh, and she was from Hot Springs, Arkansas, which is boyhood home to another president, Bill Clinton, and the birthplace of Billy Bob Thornton, for Billy Bob Thornton right. fans. More, more significantly, perhaps, Arkansas is a southern state. It's rim south rather than the deep south. And there's kind of arguments the same way we have things like, you know, is Harrogate really in the north? Um, but Arkansas is a southern state. However, she was from a fairly comfortable middle class background um, and had a, a fairly happy upbringing by all accounts. She attended segregated schools and Howard University, which was a historically black university, where she first met her future husband, Kenneth Bancroft Clark, the other part of this couple. He was to be the first Amer African-American tenured full professor at the City College of New York and the first African-American to be president of um, the American Psychological Association. Um, and if you look at her dates, um, born 1917, they really did this against the background of a very difficult um, time to be black in America. Um, they worked together both on sciences and they were very important in the civil rights movement. But the doll experiments for which they're famous uh, were very much her baby, so to speak, um, originating in her master's thesis, the development, of unconscious, the development of consciousness of self in Negro preschool children. Donald, can you tell us about their work, those experiments, and how ultimately their work led to a historic Supreme Court judgment? Yes, you, you said they became famous because of the doll experiments. And I really, I, I'm so pleased to be doing this pair because they're not famous enough, in my view. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've already, you know, Maslow and Kohlberg are far far more uh, better known the, uh, uh, than Mamie and Kenneth Clark. But I, I think Kenneth, Clark, uh, uh, Kenneth and Mamie should be better known than Maslow, for example. Uh, I think the important thing was this very early research born of real lived experience in a segregated world in the US. Uh, and they were the first to do this really deep research into the effects of that segregation by race, by race, it's hard to imagine, using these doll experiments on the self-consciousness of race and attitudes on race amongst children. In other words, when you segregate schools, what effect does it have on the minds of those black and white children who have been segregated? And of course, the great thing about these two is they had a real causal effect on the civil rights movement and changed the world forever through a very famous court case. Let's let's go to these doll experiments for which they're best known. 
There have, of course, been dull experiments in psychology before them, and they've been used extensively since. But what they did was something quite remarkable, I think. They took 300 children in the ages were between three and seven, you're very young children, and asked, asked them about four very specific dolls that were all identical apart from color. Okay, so a single variable color here they're testing for. And they wanted to identify what perceptions and preferences they have of these dolls, right? And what they found was worrying, to say the least. They found the positive perceptions and preferences for the white dolls, even amongst the black children. Okay. This is the worrying thing because you then can infer that they have a self-perception of inferiority, okay? Now, this finding was important because it was empirical. You could test it. You could then take it into a court case, for example, which is exactly what happened. So having done that really valuable research, they were called upon in our landmark case in 1954, uh, which was Brown versus the Board of Education, quite a famous it, it, about segregational schools, segregated schools being unconstitutional. So the very fact that, the, in a sense, their evidence was used to win this case meant that it led to the desegregation of schools, which was a profound and important moment in the civil rights movement, okay? So we had th that court case to focus on it for a moment. It, 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 you know, it, it's a bit like to kill a mockingbird type moment in a way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you have 13 families who file this class action uh, and, it, and the evidence in the class action actually is built partly, not wholly, on the doll studies from uh, Kenneth and Mamie Clark, okay, to support the idea, the very simple idea that black children were being damaged by segregation, by being made to feel inferior through the segregation process. And you could measure that psychologically, okay? So the harm and damage was measurable. This was uh, an astounding bit of learning theory because it really is one piece of learning theory that changed the world. Huh. and helped lead to desegregation, not just in schools, but in buses and all sorts of other areas which were extant in the United States at that time. And this is why I'm slightly puzzled that they're not better known, because it was a profound moment hmm. where a lot of good came from a piece of solid research and learning theory. And that uh, Supreme Court judgment, give it its name, was Brown v. Board of Education. That's so correct. A kind of landmark and very important civil rights movement. Yeah. What influence did they have on learning theory? I mean, I, I, I kind of gathered from reading Wikipedia that um, Mamie Clark particularly struggled um, to have much of a career because partly because yeah. of sort of you know entrenched racism and, and so on. But did they have a big influence? Were they are they being rediscovered now? Well, um, sadly, I don't think they are being rediscovered. I never hear them mentioned, even though I'm big fans of them both. Uh, I hardly ever hear them mentioned, even in this age where unconscious bias training and so on and all that sort of stuff is extant. You you just don't, you, the, the people don't see have much knowledge of them in a way. It's rather puzzling. In their lifetime, however, to be fair to Mamie Clark, she went on and did a lot of real activism. This is what I like about some of these people. You know, she didn't hang around. She wasn't hanging around in academia resting on her laurels. She actually mm. went out into the real world to do real things with real, young black kids. So I think that's all it. Uh, Kenneth was slightly different because he, you know, the American Psychological Association position. Yeah, he did have a big career. That's more to do with a gender distinction there, I suspect, which we'll come to it with one of our other moral theories. Yeah. Intersectionality, but, Donald. Yes, yes, in modern parlance. <laughs> but I, I think, I think what what they did was create history in many ways. You know, they broke the back of the system, helped mm. break the back of the system, and that's why they deserve to be to be greatly admired. So now Jane Rowland Martin, yeah. uh, 1929, she was born and is still among us, uh, yeah, 92, yeah. I think. At, uh, yeah, she'll be in her 90s uh, now, isn't she? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, another woman, a philosopher known for her work on education. Um, Jane Martin is Professor Emerita of Philosophy at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, born in New York City. Uh, it seems to be a theme of this episode. I don't know why they're all so moral <laughs> in New York City. Winner of the Guggenheim Award in 1987, and as with as with other living academics we featured in this series, not a lot of biographical information readily available on the web. Her chief focus was on women in education. The definition of education itself, she says, has neglected women. Donald, could you tell us about her work? Yes, the reason I really like Jane Rowan Martin is she took this holistic view of the role of women in education, and she quite rightly points out the basic premise here, which is women have been ignored and largely excluded 
from the creation of learning theory or the learning institutions themselves. Until the early 20th century, it was almost impossible to get a degree if you were a woman, for example, even into the early 20th century. And mm. what she does is something quite interestingly in a big, broad sense, that's why I've picked her rather than the many other theorists in this area and feminists in this area, is that she had this sort of almost anthropological view of this and, look, and, and thought that there were lots of hidden assumptions in the curriculum, for example, which was quite male dominated around fixed cultural subjects and knowledge, you know, uh, created by men for men, as it were. At the uh, and what what was missing from that then? Well, very clearly, you know, you got all that uh, all that real world knowledge and skills women as mothers have, women who work in the caring professions, especially she thought had been ignored in nursing and so on. So in particular, she came to she came to this focus on gender through feminism, uh, and thought that actually the deification of education, education is a great thing, had ignored one big thing in neglecting women and their role in this. Mothers are, play an incredibly important role in the education of their children. But do we ever mm. hear people talking about that? We don't really hear much about that, you know? It's almost as if it's just there. So she yeah. looked for much wider sources of education in society in general, in things like books and magazines and television programs and so on, sort of mum's nets of their days, as it were, yeah. uh, and thought that there was an ignored role of women as in mothering raising children and in the and in the caring professions and really was against education focusing too much on academic subjects and thought that the vocational had been abandoned and boy is that still a topic that's alive and kicking today so, so this is her reconceptualization of education around away from what she called spectator knowledge what we mm. assume to be good for us is actually not what happens in the real world I want to ask a question that I'm finding difficult to formulate without appearing to demote the importance of what she says about women in education, you know, sure. hashtag women in learning. Obviously, that is of huge importance and it's of as much importance to men as it is to women. But what does her work do to change our conception of learning in a more general sense? Yeah, well, she so she does tackle this. So that was our general thesis about the role of women in learning, which she did lots of research and lots of writing on. But... She has a very specific, very specific thoughts on learning theory. So we'll turn to them. The first is this idea of a, a multiple educational agency. In other words, education doesn't come from just school or institutions or universities, far from it. Actually, real education, when you look at it empirical, empirically, comes from your parents, first of all. She thought that whole parent, parental family context played this huge mm. role in education that was often ignored. A family, and then you widen the, these circles of influence out into the community in general, your close relatives, but also the mm. people in your street, <laughs> in your community, out in a church, youth groups, sports clubs, the media, the internet, other institutions. Uh, so uh, these all play a role in the education of us as individuals long before schooling came along. School is a, universal schooling is a relatively recent thing in our, uh, in our cultural history. So learning happens everywhere. So there's this, she has this theory called multiple educational agency, and she thought it was very important to see education in that holistic fashion, okay? And I think that was her big contribution here, which we, of course, still studiously ignore. We still funnel people furiously towards university, ignoring almost every other form of education, whether it's sports clubs or vocational education or other contexts in which learning can take place. Hmm. And I think it's such a, a big initial point that you know ought to strike anybody who teaches you your first language i mean generally it's your mother yeah uh, for the english upper classes of course your nanny that's different <laughs> so let's move on sure. to herbert marshall McLuhan, 1911 to 1980 and yes. this next name is one i grew up with um as in i can't remember a time when i didn't know the name marshall McLuhan and his tagline, The Medium is the Message. And it must have got embedded in my memory very early, I mean, as far back as the early 60s, along with stuff like the SO sign means happy motoring. And perhaps that's appropriate, given that like uh, Watson, the behaviorist, he also worked um, for advertising. And as the years went on, he just seemed to keep cropping up for me. And that slogan just seemed more and more prescient. But I find that when I think about it, that I know almost nothing about him. And yeah. have read very little of his. So when I glanced at Wikipedia for the purposes of this interview, for instance, I was amazed to find he studied English at Cambridge under I.A. Richards and F.R. Levis in the 30s, yeah. which is a bit shameful, um, not only because I'm an English lit grad, but I particularly studied the 30s. And, and that kind of turned my head around because I'd always thought of him in a way as a 60s <laughs> figure. 
but yeah, yeah. he converted to Catholicism um, was at Cambridge in the 30s. And that puts him, you know, a direct contemporary of uh, people like Evelyn Waugh, um, Graham Greene. Uh, and of course, everyone was converting either to Catholicism in that era and, and that class or else to communism. Um, I, as I say, I thought of him as a 60s person. Of course, he was Canadian and spent most of his life teaching at the University of Toronto. So enlighten me, Donald. All I know really is that he was an important theorist of media. What are his major ideas there and why is he important for learning? Yes. I mean, the interesting, reflecting what you just said there, John, the interesting thing about Marshall McLuhan is when you read the books, they are remarkably fresh and insightful. You know, it's as mm. if they were written yesterday. Of course, it was pre-internet, so lots of the nouns are, are a bit misplaced for us yeah. because we know what did happen. But he was also quite prophetic, which is interesting. We go back and read McLuhan and boy, what happened was exactly as he thought it would happen. Yeah. Now, we have this, so we have this caricature, the cliched view of Marshall McLuhan, I think, which is medium is the message and the global village. You know, the, he's known for yeah. those two phrases, which, you know, was almost cliched and so on. Interestingly, he also invented the word surfing for that sort of, but he, he actually invented the word to mean the casual and fragmentary media browsing, you know, flicking through TV channels and so on. But actually it caught on and then it was applied to the internet. But we're, he's known for those little aperçus, you know, those little insights, as it were. But actually his writing is quite detailed in many ways, you know, and the, the Gutenberg ga Galaxy is just a, a fantastic book, you know, where he's exploring this relationship between the media the mind and society, those th three points in a triangle. Uh, and it concentrates on print. That's why it's a beautifully focused book. And he thinks that print brings to the mind a sort of linear sequential mode of thinking about the world. This he thinks is, is a great danger. He's not alone here, going back to Plato and others. Many have, of course, come to this conclusion that print is a rather dangerous and limiting medium in many ways because it mm. simplifies, separates and subsumes other modes, uh, you know, and ignores things like hearing and speech, which are primary modes of communication. So it's more Plato than uh, than Socrates, as it were. The Industrial Revolution, he thinks, uh, created the print revolution. And then he has some interesting theories about private readers. So we become, as readers, private people, isolated from each other, less continuity, less social contact, less social interaction. What does this mean? It becomes a narrow band method of communication print. This has come back, of course, print cycles around through social media to becoming much more expansive again when we can actually use it with many other people on Twitter, if you've got 10,000 followers or whatever. But in a sense, he saw most media, you know, his first match at this was print, but he saw most media as leading us towards this global village. And what a wonderful two words those are, the global village, because that's exactly what we live in today. When this podcast mm. goes online, it's launched into the global village. We will have people from all over the world listening to it. And that is a great thing, but he was—he was no—he had, he had very little time for the dull moralizing about tech. People often think he was one of these precursors about isn't technology a terrible thing? The surveillance, mm. capitalism, and so on. But he had very little time for that type of mor dull moralizing. He was neither an evangelist nor a traditionalist in that sense. He saw technology as something that was worthy of really serious study. He, mm. he said the time has come where it plays such an important role in our lives that we need to really look at it. Seriously, and that's what he does, of course, with perhaps his most famous book, Understanding Media, yeah. where the medium, medium is the message comes from. Hmm. So, uh, it kind of invented media studies. Um, yes. but, but you know, you shouldn't hold that against him. I mean, for me, he's a, a, a really big figure and an interesting figure because of his continuing relevance. You know, I, I think of him, I suppose, in the same bracket as people like H.G. Wells, Asimov, um, uh, the guy who wrote New Romancer, William Gibson, as making predictions about the future that actually came true and continued to come true. So how is he wearing in the age of the internet? Um, which some of what he said seemed to predict. Facebook has just rebranded as Meta um, yeah. at the time of uh, speaking, which seems a very McLuhan-esque peg to hang your hat on. Because I, I kind of think of McLuhan every time a, a, a teenager said, oh, that's very Meta. Or, you know, you're watching Simpsons and your teenage child said, oh, yeah, that's very Meta. Um, that was the medium is the message for me encapsulates the, the, the idea of meta that, that, that stuff is about itself. And that seemed to start happening in movies with the Spielberg generation, you know, where they, they were so intent on kind of movies about making movies. And when I wrote my own novel, I got to the end of it, didn't quite know what it was about. And I realized, oh, yeah, it's about 
writing a novel. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it seems we're kind of caught up in this thing. We we are still living in McLuhan's world. Sorry, rather long question, but how is he wearing in the age of the internet? No, I think it was a very good question in the sense that you focused on that medium as medium as the message uh, phrase. And let's let's bounce off that a minute because I think mm. that's important. Uh, famously misinterpreted by the publisher, the publisher called it the massage as the medium. The massage, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I got that book for Christmas. I thought, hey, <laughs> what? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yeah, let's not go into that one. That's another podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. McLuhan actually loved that error. He thought it was hilarious, you know, because because he thought it was hilarious because his whole thesis on the medium as a message is that we become the tools we use. You know, mm -hmm. that, that that notion that it changes our whole relationship with the world. You know, we use the tools and then we become the tool itself. It sort of seeps into us and we feed it back into the world. Uh, but speed replication, pattern, scalability, that's all the features that media gives us. Those are good things. Remember, he's not a moralist here. He's not saying that all oh, technology is bad. He's just saying, let's look at this seriously. How does it actually work? Okay. So he does think that technology not it shapes how we learn, it shapes what we learn as well. I think that's quite clear. You know, we're sort of fed algorithmically to a degree, uh, but it also opens up, us up through search to doing what we want. You know, there are good and bad sides to all this. But learning brings with it, if we bring this back to learning for a moment, because he did think and write about this. Learning technology brings with it an implied pedagogy. That's what he means by the medium as a message. Okay. Medium, as, medium as a message for learning people means that te technology brings with it an implied pedagogy. Mm -hmm. But few have realized the profound, of course, this has always been the case. We don't really have, we don't really diss the alphabet or writing or manuscripts or books or painting or chalkboards, but they're all technologies that shaped our pedagogy. You know, mm -hmm. so we, we, we tend to just criticize the new and Marshall McLuhan didn't like this much. That's why he went back to things like printing and writing and looked at their roles as technologies. So from, you know, in learning technology, McLuhan's idea is that technology itself shapes our social world. That is coming to pass. And he absolutely predicted this. I, I think he would have been amazed at how quickly and then the sheer scale in which it became, the global village became a global school, a global learning village. Mm -hmm. now he he had explored, you know, how old media get also how old media get carried over into new media. That's a really fascinating one for learning technology people because we saw during COVID, basically people just took meeting software and slammed into Zoom and thought that was teaching. Okay, so we had this mm -hmm. emergency elastoplast type approach to online learning. That was a tip. McLuhan predicted this. He was saying that people who come to new media just simply take the old media and shove them across. You know, theater was at first presented on television until we got to grips with the grammar of film and television. And the same in online learning. We tended to record lectures or slam up didactic things onto the screen, bits of media, as if that is all there is to the case of learning. Whereas actual fact, it's a new medium. Something like VR is literally a new medium. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand the grammar of that new medium to use it properly. You know, not see technology through a rear view mirror, taking the old stuff and presenting it new. This is a big message from McLuhan, which many in learning technology and learning theory consistently ignore. And in many ways, the whole LMS build loads of content model is exactly that. That sort of, you know, dump bank knowledge type model, whereas the newer world of LXPs and AI and data is taking a much more McLuhan-esque view. It's a new medium with its own grammar, its own way of doing things. Uh, that's what's so wonderful about the newer technology. Uh, mm. uh, yeah. I think yeah. we could do a whole podcast about McLuhan because oh, yeah. he's a really interesting figure, but unfortunately figure. we have to move on. So we're on the subject of, of media, um, someone who um, perhaps wasn't as keen on it as McLuhan, or yeah. new media. Neil Postman, 1931 to 2003, another New Yorker, another media theorist and cultural critic like McLuhan. He studied at SUNY Fredonia and Columbia, taught at NYU, fairly prolific writer, wrote 20 books and more than 200 magazine articles. Also collaborated on the development of a model school based on the principles espoused in one of his books, Teaching as a Subversive Activity. So kind of Toby Young figure, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Teaching as a Subversive Activity, great title. His most famous book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, also is a great title. Uh, he, he was good at titles, but when you look down that list of titles, like uh, Technopoly, The Surrender of Culture to Technology, 
1992, the disappearance of childhood in 1994, the end of education 1995. You do start to pick up a bit of an eschatological vibe. You know, the, the, end, the, the, the world is ending. We're all going to hell in a handbasket because of media. Um, so, Donald, was he just another one of those angry, shouty media phobes telling us that television is rotting our culture away from the inside? And I think that's a tune I've been hearing personally for as long as the SO sign means happy motoring. Or is there more to him than just that? I mean, he's not just that Peter Finch character in the movie Network screaming out of the window, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take any more, is he? Yeah. I mean, I think you're right in that, you know, amusing ourselves to death is the tune we hear, but it, yeah, it was a bit like Beethoven. You know, you, you wouldn't classify Ode to Joy as being Beethoven. You know, there was more to him than that, as it were. And the same yeah. is true of Postman. I think he was... I mean, I remember reading Amusing Ourselves to Death, and although I disagreed with almost everything it said, it was an amazing book to read, a real challenge. I think, unfortunately, in many ways, Neil Postman has been taken up with more verve <laughs> and enthusiasm than Marshall McLuhan, and I think that's a shame, in a way, because they're balancing mm. figures in many ways. You know, McLuhan wasn't this sort of deep pessimist about technology. He thought it was a real thing, we have to just get on with it and understand it. But for Neil Postman, remember, he, his primary critique was against television. And I think for young people today, really forget about the sheer scale of this. Uh, I mean, it's been well documented now, but everybody of our generation, John, literally watched five or six hours of television seven nights a week for most of our lives. You know, It yeah. was a remarkably dominant media, OK, as a mm. cultural and educational force. Uh, but of course, what, what Postman says is that technology can impress, and it does, but it can also oppress. So he was keen to, to work out how it could be used for good, but also keen to expose the ways in which it was bad for learning and cultural development. So in the disappearance of childhood, uh, 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 can it be preserved? <laughs> and can it be preserved? The subtitle is very interesting. He really, he really decries the falling away of print and reading as television takes over. And mm. that arguably... And I'm not too sure that that's true of the internet, where kids read every five minutes. They just read. You have to be able to spell to search. You know. Yeah, I think there's a renaissance in reading in, in many ways, because he was stuck in the idea that reading meant books. But of course, reading are texts. The book is the medium. The, you know, the, the actual text is the important thing here. But he thinks that, you know, since the renaissance, we've been drifting away from books and print and television, he thought, destroyed the very idea of childhood. It sort of blurred this adult-child distinction. Uh, and that, I like many of you know the, the postman thing. You got to you got to very take his universal statements very very carefully here, and he tends to be very general in his pessimism, which worries me somewhat. Nevertheless, if we come to education and learning for a moment, in in the end of education, now there's a title, the end of education. Hmm. He, he sees rules as as being very important in terms of you know the sort of dissemination of values and knowledge and the passing of knowledge from one generation to another skills, higher skills, critique, critical thinking, debate, social skills, and so on. But he thinks that the effects of technology could lead to a reversal in the good things in school. You know, the effects of technology could be bad. Forgetting the fact that, of course, most of what goes on in schools uses technologies, pens, pencils, paper, chalkboards. Blackboards, yeah. Blackboards, writing, you know, they're, they're there anyway. He tended to miss that point, that technology has always been there. But... I think his, his point is that you find in TV and film this passive. This is where he was, I think, very, very useful indeed. And modern designers of learning could do well by reading Postman because his main argu argument was that teaching should be a form of dialogue and not entertainment or amusement. Hmm. And the dangers that with gamification and video and so on, what we're doing is giving the illusion of learning. It, yeah. it looks great, it's exciting, it's got all that engagement, but actually people don't learn. And he was very precise on this, okay? So he talked about what he called information action ratio, and that's that media distances, some media distances from relevant and local information that leads to action and transfer and your ability to do things in the world. And he thinks mm -hmm. that video is very dangerous here because it's a sort of transitory medium, goes in one ear and out the other, or in one eye and out the other, because you don't have time to settle, engage with it, reflect, and do all the things that your brain needs to do to be able to then use that knowledge afterwards. Okay. And this is it's called the transience effect in cognitive psychology. It's been yeah. studied to death, and he was right. He was spot on here. This passive viewing of media very rarely results in effective learning. Okay? Hmm. So, uh, yeah. 
so I was just going to say, so he lived to 2003, so just past the kind of Cambrian explosion of e-learning. Did he comment at all on kind of modern forms of technology-enabled learning? I mean, experimentation in that area had been going on since the 60s, computers and learning. Yeah, he did, but not much, to be honest. But, you know, he's getting quite old by then, of course, but when yeah. the stuff came in. Uh, but I think an interest. I think a book where he does, in a way, where he tackles it head on is in Technopoly, that weird word oh, yeah. that you mentioned earlier. The, and yeah, so it's that board it, game. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't so much about learning, but the tech, the cultural consumption. Now, I really love a, a French author called Baudrillard, who I think is far superior to, to Bozeman yeah. on, this, on this stuff. But to be fair, he had more of a balanced view there, where he saw te- technology as being both good and bad. But... It, the danger is that we look for it for authentication of our culture, or if as soon as we allow it to determine what our culture is, then we're in real trouble. You know, uh, and I think that's happening with the globalization of Netflix to a degree where the whole world is suddenly watching, you know, Squid Games or whatever, and then suddenly, you know, it, it, it's regarded as the, as the be all and the end all and the, the perfect critique of capitalism. No, mm. it's not. <laughs> you know, no, it's not. You know, uh, all these, if we think that uh, solving the world's problems is by watching a box set, then, we're, then we really are in, in trouble. Mm. But he's a bit disingenuous here, but confusing text with print and paper, for example. And even in that book, even though he's a sort of jealous guardian of culture and print, I think he gets that wrong. Because with modern technology, he doesn't quite realise that actually most of it is print. <laughs> a, and in actual fact, this sort of dialogue that we are having on a podcast is another new mm. medium that's emerged that's very much in tune with his views of dialogue and so on. And that most of the time we spend online and in on, online learning is in dialogue. You know, if you're on Facebook, it's dialogue with other people. If you're on Twitter mm. and social media generally, it's an enormous dialogue with that, an enormous number of people, enormous circles of influence, light touch, strong touch, and so on. Uh, yeah. We have the ability to Zoom, and I do this all the time. I speak to people on the other side of the planet, in America, or whatever, for free. So all those social dimensions, all those print dimensions, actually are folded into the new omelette of new technology. And he never came to grips with that, really. I think he was no. so he by that time he had been so stuck in the rut of critiquing technology as a destructive force in culture. The nature of our particular medium is that uh, we have to move on now and sum up. Um, right. How would you sum up the legacy of this group of thinkers? Um, and is it possible to do that, in fact, when they seem each to be concerned with quite different aspects of morality, although they all kind of relate to each other, each had their own sort of area? Yeah. Can, can you sum up across that any, any general principles that come, come out of this? I'll have a go. I'll, I'll do some specific ones, then try to come to a general conclusion, John. Okay, so okay. in this little sweep of morality in learning theory, first off, I'd say be very de- be very wary of these simplistic, hierarchical, staged models. The models we found in Maslow, for example, there's really very little to salvage, you know, from what was an unscientific, selective, almost a caricature of human needs and human mm. nature. And so the great danger is that we should be, uh, 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 when we come to Kohlberg, for example, I think we should dump that idea of character or moral training because actually the intuitionists are probably right on this and that's not the way to do it. You do more damage than good. Mm. Uh, however, there's some interesting, we then moved on to uh, some deep thinking about race and gender. This is mm. good stuff because we had some empirical research that showed that race, the, you know, self-perceptions of race do real damage to minority groups. Boy, did we have to learn that. And of course, that acted as a force, the empirical evidence acted as a real causal force in the civil rights movement and still does today. And we're living in an age where Black Lives Matter and so on is still a live and kicking issue. Uh, however, let's combine those two for a moment. I think the great danger is in imagining that training, that old hierarchical didactic approach to moralizing is a solution to those problems. I don't think mm. it is. I think HR and L&D have suddenly become obsessed by ethics compliance in such a way that they want to didactically force it down upon us rather than encouraging it within organizations. So they'll come up with a set of hokey values, you know, some five abstract nouns or whatever in, a, in an acronym where, you know, you know, the fourth word is clearly just to fit the acronym. Yeah. Uh, so we've got all that values training and then you've got all that compliance training around ethics and then of course all the they've even now probing our unconscious 
where did that, that one come from? So we have all this crude training around ethical stuff, whereas what the lesson we've actually learned from our broad sweep here is that actually that's wrong, that we should look at more towards the context in which ethical decisions are made and change processes, little subtle changes in the real world, as opposed to didactically trying to change people's mind because their ethical thinking is fundamentally intuitive uh, you have to change the context rather than the mind. The mistake is to think that morality is rational, and by simply giving people reasons and rational courses, they will suddenly become moral beings. This mm. turns out not to be true, which is why billions of dollars are wasted on that type of training. Okay, So that, that over-moralizing uh, with the use of media and technology, I think, is a mistake. Another one, of course, for the last two, McLuhan, and Postman is we need to calm down on the pessimism and study technology seriously, as McLuhan wanted us to do, and understand mm. that all technology has its good and bad influences. It is intrinsic to the nature of technology. And that these broad moral condemnations that we get from people, you know, AI is the has become the devil incarnate all of a sudden because it doesn't have transparent algorithms. I mean, you have a lot of really shallow thinking or the imposition mm. not of moral, moral thinking or the application of the common good or moral principles, but actually a lot of grievance thinking. Let's find out all the bad things we can drum up together about this piece of technology, put them in a list and issue a Moses-like statement about what we shouldn't do and why it's bad for us. This is not moral thinking. It's not sophisticated thinking. It's not what McLuhan did, but it's what we do a lot of the time. Yeah. And you see this at conferences. You know, you, every conference on learning starts with some hokey self-help book or some book that says this is bad for us. You know, screen time is bad for us. Technology is bad for us and so on. Actually, technology has freed, freed us from uh, most of the uh, bad things that we've seen in the world. It's freed you know, domestic appliances, freed women from the chains of domesticity uh, in many ways. And learning technology does the same. This is what McLuhan showed us. One thing that feels different to me is in previous ones, we've episodes we've been very experimentally based, and you talked about empirical data. We we kind of feel on safe ground in a way with you know the Clarks and you know no relation, Jane Roland Martin, in that there is an empirical basis to what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of these thinkers are more kind of like visionaries, critics, you know, or, or like McLuhan came out of. Um, English literature. Um, yeah. So how, how then do you make the judgments? Because you can't kind of like try and replicate the experiments and then judge them on that basis. Um, and it's interesting what you said about that kind of duality between McLuhan and Postman. You kind of have to have both and to yeah. balance them. Um, you might reject this term, but critical thinking comes in here, doesn't it, rather than kind of scientific method? That's a very good point. I think, well, with the exception of the Clarks, amazing, uh, Mimi and Kenneth Clark, because they they, they were exper they were empirical experiments, very yeah. clearly. As for the rest, they were very much cultural right, cultural theorists and writers, almost armchair theorists, including Maslow. Even though people think it's scientific, there was no science in it whatsoever. Uh, mm. And uh, and Kohlberg really was that sort of questionnaire type approach about reasoning and morals, which turns out to be quite misleading. But you have a good point here. However. An interesting thing has happened since then. Although they wrote widely about these subjects, we now have had a more scientific or empirical approach to this. So, for example, in moral thinking, we have people like Jonathan Haidt and his excellent book, uh, The Righteous Mind, actually does a lot of very good research on how moral intuitionism, as opposed to the rational view of morality, comes to bear and play. We have people like Kaplan who look at the economics of education. Uh, we have and, uh, people like uh, Sandel, for example, who look at... Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, the idea of questioning the social consequences of creating a graduate class, has it actually done more harm than good in creating this vast division or binary division between a graduate class and the rest? People like Goodhart of reflecting on this in a much more detailed and evidence-based way. So I think since those cultural theorists who essentially were writing books for popular consumption in many cases, even although they came they were working from an academic context. I think many of those themes have been picked up in the second half, much later, maybe the last quarter of the 20th century, coming into the 21st century, and been substantiated. I mean, a lot of their critiques uh, have been substantiated by subsequent work. A lot of them were wrong, of course, but that's the way good theory proceeds. You know, there are many hypotheses. The good ones survive, the bad ones fall by the wayside. 
That's why I like the application of the scientific method of, uh, when we look at learning theory across the board. Some of those ideas have survived, like the idea that segregation is bad and that it's bad for minority uh, kids to be, to be streamed and separated off from other kids, whether it be in the private school system or through faith schools. These issues are alive and kicking today. Uh, but the big one for me is the way that we've gradually found out that moralizing and moral training, uh, ethical training doesn't actually work because it misunderstands the very nature of moral thinking in our minds, the cognitive nature of moral, moral thinking. Hmm. So the way that good theory proceeds is comparing and contrasting and exactly the sort of thing that we're aiming to do here with Great Minds on Learning. Thank you very much, Donald. No, thank you, John. That was uh, an interesting reflection, isn't it, on the, what are what is still a huge issue? You know, the moral issues around learning and learning learning theory. This season of Great Minds on Learning is brought to you by Learning Pool, the company that helps you deliver exceptional performance with pioneering online learning platforms, creative content, and powerful analytics. For a wealth of valuable free white papers and resources on learning visit learningpool.com forward slash downloads. Great Minds on Learning comes from the Learning Hack team and is produced by John Helmer. Sound edit is by Isaac Peacock. Social media by Jay Curtis. The podcast is based on a series of blog posts written by Donald Clark and would like to thank Donald for his kind collaboration in this project. Our next episode covers online educators, Papert, Premsky, Mayer, Clark, Nass and Reeves, Norman and Nielsen. Be sure not to miss it.